This program is a Warren Stiebel production in association with SICA. Funding for Firing Line is made possible by a major grant from the John M. Olin Foundation, Incorporated. Additional support is provided by the Annenberg Foundation, the Laurel Foundation, L. John Polite, Jr., and the Friends of Firing Line. I'm Mike Kinsley of CNN's Crossfire and the New Republic magazine. This is the first of two firing line programs from Bard College, both of them focusing on the federal deficit and the national debt. President Clinton takes office facing a deficit of more than $300 billion a year and a cumulative national debt of over $4 trillion. That debt has quintupled in the past 12 years. Clinton has promised to cut the deficit in half over the next four years, but many folks who've looked at his program think that his numbers don't add up. And some believe that merely cutting the deficit in half is too modest a goal in any event. Today's guests range across the spectrum from those who fear the deficit is ruining the country and no politician is doing enough about it, to those who believe the whole deficit issue is overblown and a distraction from more pressing problems. Robert Kuttner writes on economics for the New Republic, Business Week, and the Boston Globe, among other publications. He's also co-founder of a quarterly on politics and policy called The American Prospect. David Levy is vice chairman of the Jerome Levy Institute here at Bard College. He is the co-author of a forthcoming book called The Contained Depression of the 1990s. Robert Eisner is a professor of economics at Northwestern University and a past president of the American Economics Association. James Dale Davidson is the founder of the National Taxpayers Union and co-author of another recent book called The Great Reckoning, which predicts a major worldwide depression during the 1990s. Sounds like a familiar theme. And Clive Crook is economics editor of The Economist magazine in London. He has served as Washington correspondent of The Economist and also in the British Treasury. Mr. Buckley, would you explain a mystery to me? The Democrats have controlled Congress for four decades but the deficit never really took off until Ronald Reagan became president in 1981. Why is that? It was in part because uh, Mr. Reagan thought that something uh, pretty massive ought to be done to persuade the Soviet Union that another arms race would not be profitable and under the circumstances uh, uh, goosed up the military from about 5.2 to about 6.2, but, but it coincided with uh, the creeping and really the exponential increase in, in what the entitlements uh, implied. That is to say, uh, on, on year, year two, it was more than year one plus that increment, and on year th three, it, it tended to grow, so that uh, it headed in the direction of 70% uh, of the GNP. But I thought it would be interesting, uh, given the introduction that you gave us, to turn and ask uh, uh, Professor Eisner, since he has written about it, <coughs> To, to explain uh, what we mean by the deficit, since he insists that actually if you, if you dissect it, uh, it, it is much less than the apparent sum of its uh, parts. Could, could you give us uh, yes, your I, explanation of that? I'd be delighted because I keep saying everybody talks about the deficit and literally nobody knows what he's talking about. The federal deficit, and by the way, it's not a national deficit, it's a deficit of the federal government, is, of course, the difference between its spending and what it takes in in taxes. The problem in what it takes in in revenues, I should say, which is taxes. The problem is that the federal government keeps its accounts in a way which resembles that of no private business, state and local government, or foreign government. It does not separate out capital expenditures from current expenditures. It's as if uh, every business were to include in his current operating budget his expenditures for a new plant, for new equipment. It's as if a person said, I'm going into terrible debt deficit because I'm buying a house. So the first place is that big thing that's wrong with the way you account for the deficit to begin with. Uh, secondly, people don't realize, many, many of them get it mixed up, the deficit is what you spend more than you take in, what you borrow in a period, you're in, usually a year. Irrespective of what you spend it on, you mean? That's right, yeah. but it adds, therefore, to the debt. So if we have a debt, and it's probably not $4 trillion, but $3 trillion, 
held by the public. We run a deficit of 300 billion. Then the debt rises to 3 trillion 300,000. Now that has an impact on the economy, but it's not precisely what people think. The major impact is that the public holding that debt is going to be spending more because it's holding the debt. If you have savings bonds, you don't have to save more if you already have this wealth. And that then brings us what should be the whole real question about deficits. Are they good or bad? And when are they good or bad? And that depends really on whether you want more spending or not. Yeah. Not but, uh, if you don't mind, I would ask you to refine that first uh, distinction because, uh, uh, as you suggest, it's going to strike most uh, people as something they hadn't thought of. Uh, if uh, What would R&D be? Is that a capital expense? That's an excellent question, because it is not counted. And that, that's even private accounting is absurd about. You know, we only count the investment in plant and equipment in, for private business. We don't count R&D. We don't count the government R&D spending as investment. We have no separate capital account for government. Which, which, which should we do, I'm asking you? What should we do? Oh, we, yeah. should, we should count it as investment, what certainly. About, what about defense? I would count that part of defense, which is investment, as investment. I may differ with some others around here as to whether that is worthwhile expenditure. That's not the point. But that's not the point, yeah. exactly. If, if you buy tanks, that's an investment. Even if you spend on Star Wars, that's nothing we're enjoying now. The idea is it will have a payoff in the future. But doesn't it? Doesn't it depreciation. And you, you should include yeah, the depreciation of the current accounts. That's right. Well, but, but doesn't, doesn't an investment suggest, if we're going to sell it, to uh, the next generation as having been such, that there are going to be benefits that will inure to them. But how can they have benefits, let's say, from the hardware that's left over after a military engagement that ceased happening? Well, well that suggests is perhaps you should have a rapid depreciation rate or a write-off of it. And that, that, of course, is a real problem for the economy at this point, to, to devote our resources to things that will be useful now. Well, let me ask uh, Mr. Crook, in, in Great Britain, do they attempt to make this uh, distinction? There has been some talk of it recently, but I think it's a distraction, actually, from the, uh, from the issue. Um, there are many different ways of measuring the deficit. Um, different ways are appropriate, appropriate for different purposes. But to make these corrections and adjustments and conclude from that that the deficit's not a problem, it seems to me is... Uh, to miss well, we the main we have, we point. Have said that. I, I haven't concluded that. Yeah, it it that. may or may not be a problem, I say. We, we just, we're struggling with some definitions here. Uh, let me ask you this. Is it or is it not true, uh, Mr. Cotton, as, a, as, a, as an eco economic journalist, that there's an awful lot of hanky-panky done? For instance, everyone knows that Nelson Rockefeller, since he was bound by the New York State Constitution to balance the budget, did so by lifting current expenditures or what would strike you and me as such, and sticking them in the capital budget and therefore saying they don't really count as, uh, 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 as deficit spending. There is, no, there is no regulation in the federal situation that makes that a profitable maneuver, is there? Well, in the federal situation, as Professor Eisner has indicated, there is no it. capital budget. Now, there, there is, in fact, an appendix to the annual budget right. which estimates what fraction of the budget is by some reasonable and definition capital spending. And that's given us about 50-50 for the last 10 years, hasn't it? No, it's, it's the capital portion has been declining, and that's, that's, that's right. one of the sources of the shortfall in investment in this country, is that the public sector component of uh, our total investment relative uh, to the total public outlay has been declining. And unfortunately, when the national income accounts were set up after the war, um, they just didn't pay any attention to this. The assumption was that everything that the federal government does by definition is consumption, when in fact some of it, we can't tell down to the penny how much, but common sense would tell you that some of what the federal government does, not just on tanks, really is investment that does pay you know, benefits. This is a lot of the science and technology that we've reaped have been sp spillovers of the Cold War. That, by the way, is being revised. The uh, United Nations recommend a system of accounts to which the U.S. is committed to move will have a separate capital budget within. That's for the, you know, the economists, for the Bureau of Economic Analysis. The Congress is moving that way. Was uh, it you who wrote, or was it uh, some uh, one of you, that uh, applying uh, this, um, uh, applying these standards? Our average deficit during the last 12 years was only about $19 billion. Was that yours? No, I don't think I said average over, I think I have a $19 billion figure somewhere or other for a, 
a year or so ago, but that's also making other adjustments, an adjustment for inflation I haven't come into, which is not properly made, and also including the state and local government surpluses. We're rather unique in this country. We have a separate federal and state and local, and we tend to look at one and not the other. The federal government is giving about $170 billion a year to states and localities, which in turn have been running now diminishing surpluses. It hardly ever gets into the conversation, but if you're looking at the impact on the economy of government, you should look at the total government surplus or deficit, and since the state and local governments are still running some surplus, uh, the, total the, total. Is, is the total <clears throat> deficit is somewhat less. Yeah. Okay, now, now let's move to a question of policy and ask Mr. Levy. Um, your position, as I understand it, is that uh, to concentrate on the size of the deficit is to distract from the kind of uh, attention to public policy that makes sense at this point? Well, I, I would put it a little bit differently. Uh, my point is that the deficit, which we often talk about as if it's the disease coming out of Washington, and certainly parts of it represent certain types of disease in terms of bad policy, but rather the deficit is very much a symptom of a disease in the private economy. Capitalism is, is the best system known to man, but it doesn't always uh, assure perfect balance, just as we have sometimes build-ups in inventories that cause recessions. We also, over long periods of time, sometimes have overbuilding of capacity, as we see all over the country now, in commercial real estate, in the automobile industry, in other manufacturing industries, in services, fast food, airlines, and so forth. So right now, because of the weakness in the private sector, uh, as there's retrenchment going on after all this overexpansion, uh, the economy is leaning very heavily on this fiscal stimulus to keep it going. Well, is the logic of that, Mr. Davidson, uh, uh, following the Keynesian formula, if, if we have a capacity that's not being used, should we indeed spend more money even though the deficit would then rise concomitantly? Well, I don't accept that uh, argument. I think that if, if it were true uh, that Russia would not be uh, vanishing as an economy, they have a lot of excess capacity. Well, they're running huge deficits. They don't have a capitalist deficits. system to ma I mean, their management of assets and capital. Well, pick another country. You've got a lot of countries that have run huge deficits and run their balance sheets. Well, on let, the let's ground. take Sweden. Sweden now has 7 percent, and they said it's too much last time That's around. Right. They've cut, they cut 20 they, they want to go 6 percent, which is our rate. <clears throat> I think that the, the, the difficulty here is that we tend to, to suppose that governments have a great deal more power than I believe they really do. Uh, if you look across time, uh, Every society which has gotten into trouble has tried as a first approximation to solve that problem by spending money it didn't have. Now, they either do that by financing it through inflation or by trying to run down their balance sheet if they have a balance sheet to run down. But at the end of the day, they tend to avoid the solutions to the problems, which are quite real. Uh, Professor Eisner, in his comments about the accounting gimmicks of the, of the federal budget, gives the impression that if there were more correct accounting, more sophisticated accounting, that we would see that the deficit is less of a problem. In fact, if you take the projection of the uh, uh, likely tax receipts, as the government, the, 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 con the Congressional Budget Committee did, and you look at all the unfunded liabilities of the federal government and produce a balance sheet for the federal government, their first uh, conclusion was, using generally accepted accounting principles, that the net worth of the U.S. government was minus $16 trillion. Now, they may back that down. You may say, well, this is not uh, important, and who cares what the worth of the government is. You can say all those things, but you come right down to the bottom line. The United States government is racing toward insolvency with the greatest speed uh, that the well, politicians That, 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 that is a forward. very misleading uh, figure. You know, projections to the year 2030 or whatever <clears throat> depend critically upon what tax receipts you estimate are going to come in, what interest rates you use to present right. value them, and I wouldn't frighten people with, with a number like that. Well, let me uh, frighten them with a different number, because if you look at the <coughs> forecast for Social Security alone, their so-called uh, most likely scenario has been running far more optimistic, in fact, than the receipts have come in. They pr proposed that we were going to have average growth, look, which is far higher than that, we've actually had. That, again, this you is know, not we true. really ought to try to get back to what the implications of the deficit are. And it's, 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 it's the hard, implication is we're running down our balance sheet. We're going to go broke for the if public we don't stop. necessarily to follow it. But the question is the real economy. You said the deficits have, you know, look what's happened in Russia. The effects of a deficit is to affect the demand, what people will spend. Now, obviously, it's not going to affect. <laughs> 
the capacity to produce. If you have a system that is broken down, you don't have any productive machinery, you have no laws or anything else, printing money, borrowing, spending is not going to do any good. It's clear. If you have a recession, as we have had in this country, or a slow economy, where we have capacity, but people are not buying, then you have to say, what is the impact of the deficit, of the debt, on people buying? Well, Mr. Tyson, let me ask you this. Let's suppose we're talking about a million dollars, just to use a round figure. Uh, if, uh, if we wanted a million dollars more spent in order to uh, ginger up the economy, uh, and the alternatives were to have the government appropriate it and spend it, what is the assumption that entitles you to suppose that the government will spend that million dollars more ingeniously than you would? Yeah, I, I wouldn't assume that. You won't spend it. Well, I wouldn't. You won't and they will. Yes, exactly. I wouldn't assume that. I mean, you, we could have a choice. I'm, as far as the deficit discussion goes, if you have to stimulate the economy, you can do it by cutting taxes or by increasing spending. You're assuming a great deal. And you can be a conservative or a liberal. No, there, so there is actually, like, there is actually like, another way. What you're way. assuming that isn't can true I? is that deficit spending actually does generate a great growth of the economy. Setting aside Russia or Eastern Europe, look at Argentina. That's a capitalist well, look, country. It know. had productive capacity, and they ran that country right down to the bottom. And the only way they've started to recover is when they closed the deficit. Menem has eliminated the deficit, not just stopped a little bit, not just brought it down gradually. He's eliminated the deficit. Can, can, and I, that can, I, the can I jump? Of Argentina. That was can inflation I, they were fighting. Well, well, let me Argentina jump in here, because there's, there's a very important distinction here that's getting lost. Um, I suppose on this side of the table we're, we're all Keynesians of a sort, but I think there are some very important distinctions here. My view is that all deficit spending is not created equal, that That's some true. deficit spending is profligate uh, of the sort that we did during the 80s. And the need that the American economy has right now is to increase investment. Now, when you have a blowout of the kind that we did in the 80s where the aftermath involves a fall in the prices of assets and a weakening of balance sheets and a weakening of banks, and you're left with a debt that was five times what it was at the beginning of the decade, and the practical question is, what do you do? Do you deflate further, uh, or do you try and figure out a way to get productivity back up? I think all of us would say what you need to do is increase investment. And I would argue that in a, an economy like this where wages for 70 percent of the people have fallen, private purchasing power is not going to do it. Entrepreneurs are unlikely to invest at the level that we need. So in the short run, you bridge over that failure of the private entrepreneur to invest by having public investment. One more sentence, Bill. Yeah. It's not public spending that I'm advocating as a caricature comic book Keynesian. It's investment. And if the best way of getting from here to there in the short run is to have public investment, that's better than no investment, even conceding arguendo, that some of it might be pork barrel. Well, let me ask a question of Mr. Levy, on which I want Mr. Crook to comment in terms of the British situation. Uh, I, as I understand you, you say at least the government can be forced to spend it, that being the, the very idea, whereas an individual cannot. However, if one were to extend uh, that uh, tax reduction in the form of a tax credit, let's say one were to say, whereas uh, up until now, you couldn't deduct the cost of private education. Beginning tomorrow, you can deduct, you can get uh, a credit for $1,000. Now, there's nobody who has a child going to school who's not going to take advantage of that. Isn't that almost the same thing as guaranteeing th to see that that money is pumped back in? Moreover, pumped back in in a way that's very pleasing to those of you who are especially concerned well, about structuralism. I, I think that there's, there's, I mean, this brings up the broader question of uh, if you decide to spend uh, are there some ways that are better to spend mm -hmm. than others? And absolutely true. And I think that... No, no. Spend through the private sector versus yes. the public oh, sector. Oh, all right. Well, in, in some cases, and I'll give another example, where perhaps uh, in some cases we can privatize uh, what had been formerly public uh, enterprises, such as trash collection or even uh, certain types of uh, transportation systems. Uh, if it's appropriate to do it, uh, if uh, the private sector can do the job and the government, government can facilitate that happening by providing the uh, opportunity, the uh, contracts, and so forth, that's another way you can get the same kind of investment. Uh, whether it's, it, it's it, we're calling it public or private, doesn't really matter to the impact on the economy, but it does make a difference in terms of the uh, balance sheets. I think well, there's one other aspect of the deficit issue that 
that is very important to, to bring out, especially after this political can t uh, campaign. There's so much talk, uh, particularly from Mr. Perot, about uh, you know, let's just stop talking about it and do it. It's just simple. You cut spending and you increase revenue. Well, it's not that simple. The federal government is not like a private organization that can change its spending patterns and change its uh, revenue policies in a way that doesn't affect the broader world out you there. Dry out first. That's right. Yeah. When, 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 <laughs> and, and a good a good analogy for the. Uh, for the, the federal budget on top of the economy is that of a flywheel. Uh, a big heavy wheel on, on, on some kind of rotating machine will give it a momentum. So if it hits a moment of resistance rather than having a jerky movement, it will remain smooth. During a recession, the deficit automatically widens, giving the economy a little bit more of a boost. During a period of strong growth, you will see uh, actually surpluses, as we saw in some of the years after World War II. What the deficit is telling us right now is this economy is very sick. And, and you, you can see very plainly it, it, in the private investment numbers. Total investment in structures and equipment in this economy as a share of GDP, um, average for every year during the, the, the 40, late 40s and 50s, uh, excuse me, late, late 40s, uh, between 6.5 and 7 percent. Again, 6.5 and 7 percent for the next three decades through the 70s. In the 80s, it dropped to 5. Now it's down to 2 percent. We're only adding 2 percent to our private capital stock. If that isn't evidence that our private sector is sick, I don't know what is. I'd like yeah, but wait a minute. There's, a, there's, a, there's an important uh, distinction, I think, that we're, that we're missing here. The, there is a structural deficit in the U.S. Um, the, it isn't right just to look at the deficit and conclude all it's telling you is about the state of the present economy. You know, the CBO's estimates show that um, uh, the deficit's going to remain high and will grow past the middle of this decade on unchanged policies. That is as the economy recovers and as the actual output of the economy approaches its potential output. In other words, the policies that lie behind budget decisions are set in such a way that that deficit is there as a structural well, feature. Well, I have to, now, I have to I think, disagree let with just, that. Let me just finish the point. The key thing is to make this distinction between the effect of the deficit on demand and the effect of the deficit on the supply side of the economy. What Robert Eisner said earlier uh, put the entire focus on the use of the budget deficit as a way to stimulate demand. I think it's debatable, to put it mildly, that what the American economy needs now is a stimulus to demand. What it means and what President Clinton is claiming to, br to bring is um, a long-term strategy to promote growth. And that is where I think the deficit is a threat, because every dollar the government has to borrow to finance that deficit is a dollar that the private sector can't borrow to finance its own private That's investment. True. That's absolutely not true. The, the crowd, this is the crowding out theory that when the, the, the uh, government comes to the market, it's going to uh, be uh, bidding against private bidders uh, and there'll be so is. much. Just only if, you, only if you're full employment. If you're not a full employment, it's not going to be doing that. Right now, but the government borrowing is taking There's no, cap wait a minute, there's wait no wait capital market at less than full employment? It is. The, that, but that's a meaningless number. It's not a meaningless it's, it's, number. It's it's a meaningless meaningless number. Number. The fact is, with a growing federal deficit, one at a time, please. With a growing federal deficit during the 1980s, we had the most rapid surge of private sector borrowing in our, in our uh, modern history. Uh, we've also seen phenomenally it, high interest rates as a result. Interest rates coming down during the period as the deficit got bigger. At the beginning of the 1980s, the pressures shortly. on the capital market drove interest rates up. The pressures on the capital part because well, the Federal shows, Reserve decided It shows you that there is a market there for no. capital and the interest rate is the price. Well, if you well, increase well, demands on that supply of capital, interest I, rates I, I, will rise. It, it can potentially happen. I'm not questioning the crowding up, but what I'm saying is that has not been the case in recent history. I, listen, I have to cut you all off yeah. at this point so that I have a chance to ask Mr. Buckley. You know, conservatives ridicule this notion of public investment. You spend a lot of time driving around the streets of New York, albeit in a limousine. Would, would you deny from your own observation that we have over the past at least a decade shortchanged public investment in this country? And wouldn't we benefit from having, say, better streets in places like New York City? Uh, I, I would say that there's been, there have been a lot of distortions, but I would insist that most of those distortions are the result of government policy. If there is an inducement, for instance, to bid up real estate on the grounds that there are special immunities that attach to real estate, then real estate is going to be bid up. If you guarantee that there's no threat whatsoever to your $100,000 in the bank, that bank doesn't have to be very solicitous about uh, the extent to which it makes bad loans. So uh, I would like to imagine a society in which we depended less on decisions by government as what ought to be stimulated and what ought not to be, and more by decisions of the private sector. For How instance, the, the technological revolution 
makes the idea of congesting into the island of Manhattan uh, all of the financial services of America is preposterous. It, it's silly. Uh, and yet uh, a lot of, for, a lot of uh, emphasis is, is put in doing this, uh, which, uh, which is hard to justify economically, wouldn't you agree? Well, I don't quite follow. Do you, are you in favor of the government spending more to uh, improve the roads, or do you think that the private sector can do this on its own? No, I, I think it is the responsibility of the government to uh, provide for public transportation. But I think it's also true that much of what government decides to do, it decides for political <laughs> motives, and that under the circumstances, it can hold together synthetic aggregations, uh, which uh, are in fact uh, would uh, would, would uh, disassemble uh, with reference to the sensitivity to different impulses as those impulses change, as technology changes. George Gilder is awfully eloquent on that subject. I can imagine. <laughs> well, are, are you, are you uh, Don't be sarcastic because <laughs> I, I think he's genuinely eloquent. So if, if you say you don't think he's eloquent, say so, but don't All be right. sarcastic. Well, I'm sorry. <laughs> don't Your be sarcastic, up, though. Thank you very much. Next week on Firing Line, host William F. Buckley Jr. and moderator Michael Kinsley, along with Robert Kuttner, David Levy, Robert Eisner, Clive Crook, and James Davidson, conclude their discussion on what's wrong with the deficit. Funding for Firing Line was made possible by a major grant from the John M. Olin Foundation, Incorporated. Additional support was provided by the Annenberg Foundation, the Laurel Foundation, L. John Polite, Jr., and the Friends of Firing Line. For information about a video cassette of this program, write to Firing Line, 2700 Cypress Street, Columbia, South Carolina, 29205 or call 803-799-3449. That's Firing Line, 2700 Cypress Street, Columbia, South Carolina, 29205, or call 803-799-3449.